The next uh, speaker is our rebel with a cause. James is, uh, it's going to be James Murdoch. He is, his family uh, and I are neighbors. James is just telling me that he's now carrying a POMI and a US passport. There'll be a lot of questions on identity and all that kind of stuff later. But his family are from God's own, right, from Australia, which seem to be the World Cup winners in everything they touch, which is extremely irritating if you live in New Zealand. Americans find it very difficult to tell New Zealanders and Australians apart, okay? The fundamental difference between the two nations is that New Zealanders chose to live in New Zealand. <laughs> <clears throat> so James uh, was the chairman and CEO of Star Group Limited. He's uh, on the board of trustees of the National Lampoon, uh, which is in Harvard. Uh, he's the leadership counsel of the climate group. He's a crack cartoonist. He's an entrepreneur, a visionary, and a risk taker. James Murdoch. Thanks, Kevin. Hi. Th thanks very much, Kevin. And thank you, uh, thank you uh, everyone, for uh, 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 having me here. I should say thank you particularly, Nikesh, uh, for inviting me. The, um, now, Kevin's asked us to talk about a very, a very big subject. Um, you know, when we get into things like branding today and tomorrow, and you know, it's very tempting to sort of spout lots and lots of sort of marketing gobbledygook and, and, and sort of platitudes about that. And you could go on for a long, long time. I'll try not to and just be, be, be brief if I can. Because I think it's important to really think about, though, how brands and customers are really engaging with each other and what Kevin talked about earlier, that sort of movement from one to many to, to many to one, and many to many uh, in most cases is something that, uh, that is genuinely fascinating, and particularly for us at Sky here in the UK, because we're both a national brand that is you know, really adapting very, very quickly into new sectors from the television sector into broadband and telecom services and things like that. But we're also a seller of advertising as well and a seller of marketing services. So sort of being on both sides of that question is something that uh, presents some unique opportunities for us. Now, I think we all know in this room that you know, mass broadband penetration, which we're seeing kind of happen uh, globally, and really the new consumer phenomena that it spawns, and we've heard this morning already, and I'm sure a lot more over the next few days about Web 2.0, social networking, file sharing, et cetera. You know, it's creating a, really a huge host of new opportunities uh, for brands to engage with customers, and I think very importantly for customers to engage with brands. And that's something that I think is most exciting. Now, it seems obvious to say that the winners are going to be brands that can actually really embrace this, but embracing it is not without risk. I think the key thing is that the pace of change in all of this is accelerating and constant reevaluation and really reinventing of how we talk to customers and listen to customers uh, is really a task now for every single day of the business, that constant appetite for change and really waking up in the morning and say today we're going to eat change for breakfast and we're going to go and do it just for the sake of it sometimes. Um, Staying behind or staying back, defending your territory, trying to erect barriers to entry in your business, those things, I think, are places uh, that really can, can end in tears. So change is something that's, that's, that's become really crucial for us at Sky and how we approach everything we do. Now, we do talk a lot, and we can all talk a lot about important sort of new fads, whatever the newest thing is. We saw, uh, you know, people get very, very excited and still very excited, as Kevin said, uh, 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 viral videos out there when you have Nokia putting an ad. I think it was Nokia where the cat was going around the fan. I should have had a video of it this morning and then sort of leapt onto a fan and then crashed into a wall and this and that. And it went out to millions and millions of people. Uh, or that um, anti-drug uh, message that, that Kevin said. We also hear a lot, particularly here in the UK, I don't know why, about podcasting. That seems to be something that all the sort of guardianistas out there are very, very excited about. Um, but I think it's not about each individual new piece or each individual new method or tool that we see the connected marketplace kind of give a brand or give a media owner as well. It's really much more about making the whole 
come together. And I think from a customer perspective, but also from a, from a brand perspective. That's very, very rare that we see brands and customers really engage across the piece of media consumption, uh, but also media buying by, by, by advertisers uh, seeking those customers' custom. Now, you know, I think it's important to say that traditionally, and I say traditionally over the last sort of 10, 10 years, and I think still in many cases, Sir Martin was talking about creating a sort of separate vertical, we do tend to think of internet advertising or internet brand building as very much a separate piece of our businesses, and we tend to set them aside. But I think one of the most interesting things Sir Martin said was actually the growth in his PR business uh, over the last uh, couple of years, because the way I see it anyway at Sky is very much that communications from a traditional advertising perspective, from a core kind of brand values perspective, from a public relations and communi communications perspective is all something that actually fits together and needs to fit together. So whether or not it's engaging with the traditional press that writes about an industry or writes about your products for customers, uh, to engaging with the web forums that are out there, blogs, etc customers coming together to talk about your products and yourself to where you place your advertising if we're buying airtime on ITV or outdoor advertising or in the press. Putting all of those actually together from a buying and a communicating perspective on our side at Sky has actually been one of the key things that we've done over the last few years and actually collapsing that together to really try to have one message uh, to customers. Because if you don't do that, I think it can really ignore what the real opportunity is. And I think it's about the connectedness and understanding the connectedness of all media. Now, it's driven by the proliferation of networks that we see all around us in our pockets, in our mobile phones, in Blackberries, in our offices, in our homes, be it in our studies uh, uh, or uh, uh, if, the, uh, if the kids have a computer. You know, it's driven by that. But it's also driven by the fact that that ubiquitous connectivity of people uh, really leads more things for the first time into the orbit of media than we've seen before. More things are tools for communication than really we've ever experienced before. And that multiplicity is kind of keep, that multiplication uh, it kind of keeps going. Now, of course, it's not just advertisers that have to change the way they think or that are now changing the way they're thinking about this. Television networks, newspaper publishers, book publishers, movie studios, we all have heard a lot and read a lot about old media versus new media. But I'd also argue that internet companies, you know, the new media of barely a decade ago, are also really trying to struggle or really struggling to figure out how it all fits together into a marketplace of ideas and of communication that frankly feels a lot more complicated than it did uh, just, you know, just a few decades ago. Now, the connected marketplace, and this is the important thing, is really a collective of disobedience. It's self-determining by customers, that quote uh, by uh, A.G. Laffley that Kevin had up before, you know, about letting go and understanding sort of who, who's the boss. This community of connectivity is, is self-determining and it is evolving very, very rapidly. And I think for brands, uh, great brands, if you, you want to use Kevin's terminology, love marks, you know, they really need to understand this. And this bond that needs to be built with communities of customers and importantly communities of future customers uh, in a much, much more deeper and multifaceted way. Now, mo most of you at, at Sky, who, 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 uh, so most of you out there, sorry, who think about Sky, if you think about us at all, which I wouldn't suggest you should, uh, might think of us as a, as a satellite TV broadcaster 18 years ago. That's, that's sort of where we started. More recently, we became a, 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 a phone company, as I, as I joked to Nikesh earlier. I never thought we would be in the business. We always thought we'd be in the business of making great television shows and exciting things, and it was always sort of glitz and glamour and stuff like that. Now we've got people in hard hats digging up roads and talking about fiber, armored cable, and things like that. It's a lot more mundane. But, uh, but it's an interesting way to think about our business in that traditionally, all of our sort of commentators out there have thought about us as a, a very product-centric way. They've said, you're a television business. Not just you're a television business or a condom, but you're a satellite television business. You do it one way, and that's how we'll characterize you. And they had whole different people that would follow the cable business or the phone business or the production business and all of these other things. Now, 
our view actually is that this new business that we're in, if we're in broadband or telephony or other sorts of things out there, you know, is really, you know, not to say that we're now multi-product, but it speaks to the fact that our most valuable asset was never the particular cleverness or lack of it of a way that we broadcast television or a way that we provide voice services. It's actually the simple fact of a direct and ongoing relationship that we have with eight and a half million customers, families across the United Kingdom and Ireland. That's one in three households in, uh, in the whole place. Now, our ambition is really to try to make a real difference to those customers and their families by providing, yes, world-class entertainment services, which helps us in terms of providing advertising services and things like that, but also communication services, and giving them a choice and greater choices about how they communicate with each other, not just with, 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 with the world of, of, of information and content. Now, our brand is absolutely central to how we do this. It's obviously the sort of glue that binds together a lot of these things that we do. But a customer-centric kind of brand-led approach, which may seem really obvious to those of you in the audience uh, working in you know, the FMCG sector or retail businesses, or in many cases advertising, but it's really surprising how alien it has been in the media marketplace and how alien it has been in the content business, particularly in television broadcasting here in this country, where too much attention has been focused on satisfying the demands of politicians, of regulators, of constituencies outside the kind of import, most important constituency, which ends up being our viewers and our customers. Now, one fundamental insight underpinned the launch of Sky 18 years ago in 1989, and that was simply that British television viewers deserved more choice and better television, and that they were willing to pay for it, that if you gave them something better and you gave them choice, they would be willing to pay for it. David talked before about empowering customers, the sort of I can generation. You know, it's, 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 it was a great speech, and I, I agree with many of the sentiments, David, but you know, it's really, you know, it, it's, it's just a shame that it's 2007 and we're getting there now to say people, maybe they want choice and they want to be empowered and do their own, their own thing. You know, this is something that absolutely every time you go to a customer and you say, would you rather choose for yourself? Would you rather be empowered to make choices between services out there, be it consumer services, media services, uh, uh, government services? They generally say, yes, I would like to make that choice. I believe in myself to make that choice. Now, in television broadcasting, that flew in the face of conventional wisdom at the time. To say that people would want to choose, that they could benefit from having more choice and information was something that was, you know, really not something that people wanted, uh, wanted to believe. But it's been central to our business ever since. And as we've grown and we've expanded into new areas, including broadband and telephones and things like that, consumer choice and empowerment have had to remain and must remain really the guiding principles of all the things we do in establishing that brand connection, that basic mission with our customers and that community of customers is then what gives us license to go and offer those new things. Now that's why we have things like Sky Plus, our personal video recorder, why we have Sky Broadband and Sky Talk, why we allow customers to take all of the movies that they buy from us on the television service and download them over the internet onto their laptops. That would have been anathema to a business like ours just a few years ago. Now, none of these things are without risk to our previous sort of business model, if you will. In fact, they all represent risk, be it Sky Plus, to our advertising business, as I said, the movies broadband, to our core movie service and the basic copyright issues that are there. But this is important. Consistency for a brand today is not the same as consistency for a business model. And consistency for a brand is about understanding the core mission and the core values and the basic bond that we have with that community of customers that we have out there and moving through that even if, and in, in some cases especially if, it presents risks to the rest of the business model around it. So these brands and these principles really embody what we, what we stand for as a business. And they stand for more than just the characteristics of our services. So our commitment to helping customers, for example, tackle climate change, which we try to talk to customers about a lot, or if we work with local schools to encourage participation in sport, which we, which we do in over 500 schools now in the UK, they're just as much a part of the Sky brand as innovative technology or high-quality television programming, uh, uh, sports coverage, things like that. 
Now, our business in the marketplace we operate in has changed a lot over the eight, last 18 years since we launched. But you know, there is this, this one thing that remains constant about connecting customers, giving them choice. But it's important today to consistently ask ourselves, particularly in this connected marketplace, to really, and I think all of us need to ask ourselves this every day, you know, really truthfully, how close are we to our customers? You know, and I think it's important to not confuse knowledge about our customers, perceived knowledge with real understanding. You know, we spend millions of pounds a year on, on market research. We've built a comprehensive database of pretty much every household in the UK, which is terribly interesting how easy that is to do nowadays. Uh, but it's a big one. We understand a lot of data about our customers and our future customers. We have tons of it, but it doesn't equal insight. Real understanding really comes only through dialogue, I think, by listening to and talking to individual customers. Now, our contact centers in Scotland we have a bunch of contact centers up there. They handle almost a million telephone calls a week from customers. And we have a team of field engineers that make over three million household visits and go directly to talk to customers over three million times a year. Now, that's a lot of interaction with customers and a huge opportunity to engage with them actually face to face. But until very recently, it was a source of customer insight that we essentially ignored. We amassed a lot of statistics about what people were calling about, what the reason codes, so to speak, they were, and they were filed in a, in, in, on big sheets of paper. And we, and, we, and we amassed lots of statistics, important sort of performance indicators about how fast we can answer the telephone, for example, 22 seconds on average, um, which is very important. So one of the most basic things you can do, we talk a lot about understanding customers, they really want to answer the phone when I call. The basics are crucial. However, we never once asked our frontline staff these thousands of people who talk to our customers every single day about the conversations they were having, about our products and services, about what customers were telling them, about how we could make it easier for them to sell. But I'll give you an example. Since we've started doing that, you know, a key input, we just recently organized, reorganized our movies channel. We had a big bunch of movie channels. We had nine movie channels. And they were called Sky Movies 1, Sky Movies 2, Sky Movies 3, Sky Movies 4, Sky Movies 5. And it was this big thing, and we, and, and we thought it was great. We had all the movies and whatnot, and, uh, and it wasn't working. And we were actually seeing, you know, a gradual decline in terms of percentage of our customer base of, of the movie channels. And we said, why is this? We blame technology. We said, it must be about DVDs. It must be about... Um, uh, people downloading stuff. It must be about, you know, the free-to-air broadcasters, most of them state-owned, you know, bidding up the cost of Hollywood rights. And they said it was really just terrible. Um, but we went and asked our, our customer advisors, and we just said, what do, you, what, 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 what do you think? And they said, well, what you should really do is organize them by what type of movie they are. And then we can sell them better. So we want you know, a Sky Movies channel that's about sci-fi movies. And we want a Sky Movie channel that has the big blockbusters. And we want modern classics. And we want all these things. And we put together a series of focus groups, essentially, with these customer advisors. And actually, they designed the product for us directly from input with customers. And now we will see how it goes. We've just relaunched all the products, the Sky Movies products, over the last month. But it's a crucial new way for us to do business, to directly listen to our customers and feed it into the product pipeline literally within weeks of getting the information and saying, let's try this out. And that constant speed of getting customer feedback right into the product is something that's new for us and I think new for a lot of, sort of so-called traditional businesses to be able to do that. Now, it's more than ever, uh, though, I think, you know, important to realize that it's not just about talking on the telephone uh, with customers. There's so many new ways with, uh, with uh, 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 technology to get much, much closer to customers and to really change the way we have this dialogue. I think the opportunities to get closer are actually expanding you know, in, 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 very, very, uh, in very rapid and interesting ways. The volume of conversations, for example, about a company like Sky in internet chat rooms, on forums, et cetera, is something that surprised me, frankly, because I don't think it's that interesting what we do. But they, there's these people, and they're customers, and they talk all the time about our services. Now, 
our customers and our prospective customers, and in some cases our employees also, participate in all of these forums and they talk about what we're doing well, what their experience of the business is, what it's like to work at this business. It's interesting. When we look at these blogs, it's very important to be seen as a, a good place to work. Customers care about that a lot more than you would think uh, in terms of our, our reputation. It's not just about being able to recruit good people. It's just about recruiting customers as well. Now, it's very unmediated. It's raw. Sometimes it's inaccurate and unfair. But it's also a huge opportunity, and it was unimagined, again, a decade ago, to be able to listen to our customers and engage with the people who actually pay our bills. Now, it's changing the way we do business in a lot of ways that are not easy to predict. For years, we used something in the business we call software offers, where a customer would call up to cancel a subscription, and they would say, can you just give me a deal, or I want to leave for whatever reason, et cetera, and we would say, fine. And we used to call this covert marketing, right? And you would say, fine, I'll give you half price on Sky Sports. I'll give you, you know, a half price on this other product, et cetera. Now, the problem is we didn't realize fast enough that you can't do anything covertly anymore. When you have millions of customers and many thousands of them are talking online to each other about what's going on, there is no discrete offer in the marketplace. You can't put a deal in Reading and expect the people uh, in Glasgow not to hear about it and say, why am I not getting that? I'm a good customer, I've been paying you for 10 years, why can't I have that, et cetera. So we had to completely change uh, the way we did this. We had customers now teaching each other how to game the system. We had whole websites springing up saying if you call at this time on this day and you say it like this, don't let them turn you down once, don't let them turn you down twice, they'll give you a deal like this over here. And it was this discussion around that. So the number of people on discounts rose very, very sharply with these sort of hardcore serial kind of offer riders uh, in there teaching everyone else how to do it. But much more damaging, there was a growing sense of resentment amongst loyal customers. And these people are online, they're real advocates, real amplifiers for the brand uh, who felt like we were being taken for granted. Now, it was a big decision to stop doing that. We just stopped. We said, we're just going to cut it out. And we went on all the forums and engaged with all of these uh, customers out there and said, no more offers. We're just going to reward good behavior from customers now. And the response was immediate. The gratitude from customers, the gratitude from loyal customers, that suddenly you know, a lot of these other customers who had been bluffing us, saying, OK, fine, I'll pay, et cetera. You know, it was very, very interesting. So listening to our customers, though, is crucial in this, both in old ways, talking to them on the telephone, and in new ways, engaging with them in this connected marketplace uh, as actively as we possibly can. So I would just say that you know, I think that you know, every brand owner today, you know, yes, has an internet strategy, and yes, does all these things, but it's more than just about tweaking the mix between buying online versus buying elsewhere. It's really about mixing the old and the new, so to speak putting those things together so a continuum of communication can really exist there. Now, it's only the tip of the iceberg, and I'll just finish with this one point, because as the virtual world and the real world, this connected world out there and the real world of our going down to the corner shop, they are intermingling and overlapping in, in very surprising ways. We really only have to look east. I mean, Martin talked a lot about looking east to China, and Korea and places like that, but we can see now the early implications very clearly in a society in terms of how customers behave, how they talk to each other, of the overlap of social networking, of you know, uh, er always on sort of personal connectivity out there, persistent universe gaming, these frictionless communities starting to really, really take root. And these trends are emerging now as a mainstream activity for generations of customers. And that really has to change the way all of our brands kind of interact with them and allow them to interact us. So I'd urge you, you know, when you think about this, not to think of us at Sky as a deliverer of audiences in a traditional television business, but increasingly as really a gateway and a, and a, and a communication conduit with eight and a half million British and Irish families, because that's the way we think of ourselves and how we sell our own products and services. And I would say that sort of the proof point of it, in terms of pulling these things together, and I think it's important, is as a supposedly maturing business almost 20 years in, today as a business we're growing and adding customers faster than we have for the last six or seven years. And I have to say, I think it's because we simply are able today with all of these new things to listen better to our customers. So I'll leave you with that, and then I'm sure I'll get a grilling in a few minutes. Thank you.
Thanks very much, James. Listening to, um, to the homily to the customer there, if, if you think about this whole research uh, game, the journey of research, it starts with information, you track through knowledge, you go into insight, and the end game is foresight. Okay? We are mired in information and knowledge. They've become commodities, right? Everybody now has the same information. We're drowning in the stuff. We are all knowledge workers now, right? All of us are knowledge workers, whether you're in India, Bangladesh, or even Australia. Well, that's a stretch. But Yorkshire, maybe. No, that's another stretch. But most of us are knowledge workers, right? That's not where competitive advantage is to be gained, in my view. The gain is insight. You heard James talk about insight. Most insights we see from clients have one thing in common, an absolute lack of insight. Okay, they're an agglomeration of facts. They're just a summary written by the market research department, designed in any way to fit the brand that they already have. Right. So what a client calls an insight is rarely an insight. An insight is an insight once. It's something new. It's something fresh, something you've never seen before a.k.a. anathema to most clients, because if you haven't seen it before, you can't measure it, so it's a terrifying thing. I urge all of you to listen to James' story. It's not about listening to consumers or talking to them. It's about engaging them and doing something with that that is insightful and full of foresight, like changing the name of your channels from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 to having something with emotional empathy. That was a brilliant move, James.